I first encountered critical race theory in about 1996 at the annual meeting of the American Educational Research Association, which is a big conference that education professors from all over the country and to some extent all over the world attend every year. And it's usually about 15,000 education professors, um, about 70 concurrent sessions going on for about five days, so there's you know, a lot of stuff going on. And there was a session on critical race theory, and I wanted to learn what it was, and so I went to this session, and I remember when I got there, the, the room was overflowing, it was standing room only, and I couldn't get in, there was kind of people out the door. So I was having to sort of crane my neck, looking over at people's shoulders and stuff, to be able to see the people who were talking and try to hear as much as I could. Um, after that, in my field of education, critical race theory kind of took off. Not across the whole field, people are interested in a lot of different things, but for people who are interested in race, the theory was useful because it put the question of racism at the center to be able to ask, how does race work? Instead of race being one variable among many, as it is in many studies, it, it was the center. And a lot of research that focuses on particular groups of color, like African Americans or Latinos, race will be a part of the experience, but isn't necessarily at the center. So critical race theory, the fundamental question is just asking, how does race work? And because of that, a lot of people in education who are concerned about race and racism started taking up critical race theory and developing research around it. So critical race theory, it was started by a group of legal scholars in the 1980s. And it kind of took off a little bit from critical legal studies, which looks at how class bias is built into the lawmaking process, the laws and the regulations of this country, um, and how the wealthy have been able to control a lot of that process. But for legal scholars of color, the problem with critical legal theory is that it wasn't addressing racism. And if you think about the um, 1980s, 1990s, several decades past the civil rights movement, where you would think, with the civil rights movement having rolled back racist Jim Crow laws that legalized a lot of segregation and um, various kinds of oppression, and with the Civil Rights Act and to try to make things more equal, you would think you would see a diminution of racism. But that didn't happen. Racism changed some of its form, some, in some ways looked different, but it was still there, and it was still very much there. And so legal scholars of color started wondering why and asked if there were tools in critical legal theory that could be applied to understanding race. So like with a quotation, frustrated by the failures of critical legal studies to account for the ongoing negative effects of race and racism in US jurisprudence, legal scholars of color responded by explicitly examining the role of racism in producing and sustaining racial inequality. And I remember reading a book by one of the founders of critical race theory, actually this woman here, Patricia Williams in the middle, where she's talking about the idea that we're post-civil rights, so things should be equal, so why whenever she goes to a store do people follow her around as if she's gonna steal something? These are the main founders of critical race theory. Some of them have retired, Derek Bell is no longer with us, Kimberly Crenshaw is still actively involved, and she leads a group right now, the African American Policy Forum, that is trying to counter the attacks on critical race theory. But I want to walk through the main ideas of critical race theory. It is a theoretical perspective used mostly in graduate studies and people who are interested in how race works, who are, are theorists or researchers, find this a useful theoretical tool. You don't find it too much at the undergraduate level, and you find it even way, way less at the K-12 level. So what I'm gonna be talking about for the, for the first few minutes here is a graduate level theory, but I'll try to make it you know, comprehensible. But for, first, before I do that, I need to distinguish between individual prejudice and institutional racism. Because a lot of people, and the way they understand racism is through individual prejudice. I'm a prejudiced person, and so I treat you on the basis of my prejudices. But institutional racism refers to discrimination that's embedded in the procedures, policies, 
or objectives of large organizations that work against an individual or group of individuals based on their membership in a group. And what critical race theory really addresses is institutional racism, not near so much of individual prejudice, and asks from an institutional racism what's going on here. And you don't need to be a critical race theorist to ask institutional racism questions. So like, here's an example. You look at this data from the US Census about 10 years ago, looking at the racial gaps in family wealth. Oh, this is pretty stunning. It's been a long time since the days of slavery, and some time since the days of Jim Crow. And yet we have these huge racial gaps in the average household wealth. Why is that? You're not going to get very far teasing that out if you're only looking in terms of individual racial prejudice, which there certainly is a lot of. But to try to get more at the root of what's happening here, you need to look at things like who had access to land in this country starting from the beginning of the country. Um, at what point did people who are not white have access to being able to buy land? You need to look at things like how wealth is transmitted through inheritance laws. And you need to look at things like um, how, how banks have enabled white neighborhoods to um, um, extend their wealth and have suppressed the value of black and brown neighborhoods through banking policies. And those get to be institutional questions, not individual prejudice questions. Another example of an issue, this was in the New York Times about, I don't know, two, three months ago, looking at disparities of infant mortality, comparing African American and white mothers. On the chart here, black infant mortality and white infant mortality, then broken out by income level. And for both African American and white mothers, Generally speaking, the richer you are, the less infant mortality you have, although that line is much straighter for white women than it is for African American women. But it's also really startling to see that the infant mortality rate for the wealthiest black women is higher than it is for the poorest white women. Why is this? And again, to dig into this question, you need to go beyond asking questions about individual prejudice. It certainly exists and that it affects what happens, but you're only going to get so far understanding why this happens and what to do about it without looking at institutional racism. So these are a couple of questions that can be looked at with critical race theory or not with critical race theory. Critical race theory offers some specific tools and I'm going to sort of briefly synopsize some of those. Critical race theory is usually described in terms of central tenets, assumptions, and tools that you can use. The first one is the centrality of racism to the history and social structure of the nation. And the idea here is that the U.S. was founded on stealing land from the indigenous people and then trying to exterminate the indigenous people. And the economy, much of the economy, was built as a slave economy. Now, we no longer have a slave economy, except there are a few places in the economic structure where you can find that, but it's not primarily a slave economy. But the, the question becomes, how have those structures that were in place at the beginning of the nation, and stayed in place for quite a while, I mean, we still haven't given land back to the indigenous people, so that's still in place. How have those structured the rest of the institutions in this country? Another thing that, about this that I find sort of useful is critical race theorists assume that if racism is embedded in the way this country operates, it's not just disappearing. It's a permanent feature of the US. Maybe it's permanent or maybe it's not. But a lot of people, and particularly white people, like to think that racism is in the process of disappearing. And so if you don't do anything, it'll wither away and go away. But it's not doing that. And so if you assume that racism is here to stay, then rather than asking how long is it going to take before it just disappears, then you start asking how does it work and what can we do about it? Another tenet um, that I found useful in some of my own work is whites as beneficiaries of racial remedies and the idea of interest convergence. 
Um, this basically means that people act on their own self-interest. So when white people adopt a policy or agree to a policy that benefits people of color, they do so because they also see that white people are also going to benefit from this policy. If people of color are trying to advance a policy that white people don't see themselves having an interest in, then they'll, they'll block it or will only allow it to go so far. Uh, Derek Bell was one of the first people to write about this when he started asking the question, why do white suburban school districts participate in school desegregation? Are they doing it for the benefit of African American kids? Or, contrarily, are they doing it so that they can get um, federal money that is made available to help with desegregation? And he found that it was the money that was the main driver. And if the kids happen to benefit, then that's a good thing too. But the districts, their main reason for participating was to be able to get the federal money. Um, in my own work, I have an article that I published uh, not too, a few years ago, that asked the question of if most teacher, my background is teacher education, if most teacher education programs now say that they're about social justice and preparing teachers to teach diverse learners, which most of them say that, why, as a profession, does teacher education continue to turn out mostly white teachers who are minimally prepared to teach diverse students well? Mm -hmm. Why is that? And I use interest convergence as one of the tools that helped me think about that question. In teacher education programs, on the average in this country, 79% of the people working in teacher ed programs are white. So that means that it's almost like four out of five people making decisions are white. So that, generally speaking, the decisions that teacher educators make are filtered through a white lens as to what, what works, what, what they think would, would be a good idea. Most teacher education programs then have a course that is supposed to sort of take care of these issues. It may be called multicultural education, or teaching diverse learners, or urban education, or something like that. But there's a course. And then if anybody asks, where's the preparation for teaching students of color, teaching language diverse students, it's in that course. Well, what about the rest of the program? Well, we've taken care of it. We've added this course. Yeah. Um, and, and then when you probe into the content of that course, that too starts raising some limitations. Uh, my friend Paul Gorski did a study where he got syllabi from 45 multicultural education courses and found that the majority of them really didn't teach teachers about the workings of racism and how that impacts on schools and kids. Some of the courses use a deficit perspective about communities of color. Here's what's wrong with them, here's what's wrong with the kids. The majority of them use this cultural celebration perspective. We will learn wonderful things about diverse cultures, which is a good thing to learn, but without also teaching how racism works. So it was less than a third of the courses that actually were preparing teachers to be able to understand how racism works in schools and how it impacts on the lives of the kids. So that's an example of interest convergence. A third idea is challenges to claims of colorblindness, meritocracy, and neutrality. And this means that when laws and policies and procedures are adopted, they may purport to treat everybody the same. But if race operates, then it, things actually aren't colorblind, and you don't have a pure meritocracy because race is in operation, whether it's getting named or not. For example, there's been a lot of discussion lately about race in college admissions. And the newspaper where they're talking about the Supreme Court rolling back affirmative action and stuff. And the idea should be that when students apply to get into college, they get in on the basis of merit, not on the basis of race. Well, that's simple, but you can dig down a little bit and find out ways in which race works. For example, what high school you went to and how strong the college preparation was in that high school depends partly on where you live. And we live in a quite racially segregated society. So the high schools that prepare kids best for the college tend to be located in affluent, predominantly white neighborhoods. High schools that are located in Communities of color, particularly low-income communities of color, may have some college prep going on, but they tend not to have the strong college prep through the school as high schools located in more advantaged neighborhoods. How many of your teachers saw and nurtured your college potential? There's research 
on academic expectations that teachers hold for students broken out by race. And some teachers, not all teachers, but some teachers do expect more academically of white students than they do of students of color. And that translates out into how they teach and treat students in the classroom. There's also a body of research, and uh, several studies, and I've read them, th that shows that racial matching, kids being taught by teachers of their same race, has academic benefits, and particularly for African American students. Now, which students have the most access to teachers of their same race? White students, because most teachers are white. African American students, some may have no African American teachers. Many do have some African American teachers, but still, most of the teachers are white. So the question of your teachers and their expectations and where they like you and how well did they understand you gets to be a part of how well academically prepared are you for college. Who coached you on how to apply for college and how to seek scholarships or financial aid? Now I'm at CSUMB where we serve a lot of first generation students. A lot of people do understand that if you don't have somebody at home who's been through college, you don't have somebody who's going to help you with your college application or know how to help you, know what questions to ask. And I have, from time to time, uh, I'm retired now, so I haven't done this recently, but asked high school students if they're planning on going to college. And a lot of high school students from low-income uh, communities and communities of color will say, well, no, I can't afford to. And assuming that you pay the college tuition out of your pocket, not knowing anything about financial aid because their parents haven't you know, been through the system to know how the system works. I had a friend when I lived in Wisconsin who told the story about, he's African American, about going to a predominantly white college prep high school. And in his senior year, other people in his class started, started talking about letters they were getting of acceptance from college, like, oh, I got a letter, I'm accepted into Yale. And I got a letter and I'm accepted into University of Chicago. And so Mike says, oh, when am I going to get my letter? Yeah. And uh, somebody said, well, where did you apply? Apply? He didn't know. Mm -hmm. Nobody had helped him. Yeah. Family is a university donor. This was in the New York Times recently, that if two people apply for college and one of them, their family, is donating to the university, the better chance that person will get in. And legacy, you know, people in your family went to the college, so they're more likely to get in. So the whole idea of meritocracy being colorblind, when you probe below the surface, race is at work. And if you're saying that race isn't there, that we're not going to pay attention to it, then you're really not paying attention to stuff that's operational anyway. Okay, another tenet is the centrality of experiential knowledge and the use of counter stories. This basically means that the people who understand how racism works the best are the experience, are people who are victimized by racism every day. Regardless of whether they can write about it in academic terms, uh, if you just listen to people's stories about their lives, you'll hear people talking about how racism has impacted on them in, in communities of color. Counter stories, then, are stories that kind of talk against what critical race theory is called majoritarian stories, which would be white people's stories about race. This is an example of somebody explaining, and I'm going to read the quote because it's a good example of counter story. This is written by a Latina who is from South America. She explains counter storytelling is used to magnify the stories, experiences, narratives, and truths of underprivileged communities. Every way we turn, the world is filled with dominant culture narratives. Dominant culture refers to the practices, norms, and ideas that have the most power and influence in the social, institutional, and economic structures. For example, although I grew up in the US, I immigrated from South America, and I was raised in a household that held the values and practices of my home country. Throughout the years, I've held on to my culture's norms, many of which are different from those of the dominant culture in the US. This creates a difference in how I behave and think compared to how my peers and mentors may expect me to behave and think. The dominant culture maintains minority experiences in the background and is sustained through various levels of society. Things like history, textbooks, movies, fiction, academia, and media have all been centered around the experiences and lives of the dominant culture. Minority populations interacting with these forms of media may feel deeply excluded as they encounter stories and narratives that don't fit or apply to their experiences. And I've tried to make a kind of a juxtaposition between dominant stories and stories from people marginalized on the basis of race. 
with this slide that compares assumptions that are made about the nature of society, about the nature of groups that aren't doing very well in society, and the nature of solutions. So from a dominant perspective, and this is what I grew up with in school and at home, and even if people didn't explicitly say this, this was embedded in the way people talked about things. We live in a society that's fair and open to everybody who will try, kind of a meritocracy. It may not be perfect, but do your best and you'll succeed. Then if you look around and you see that some communities aren't doing very well, how do you understand disparities you see? Well, we've all learned racial and class stereotypes. Whether we believe them or not, we, we've all learned them because they're kind of in the air that we breathe. And they become an explanation for inequalities. So people may say, well, they lack knowledge, they don't have culture, they haven't assimilated the right culture, they haven't learned the language, they don't have family and community organization or family support, they're not trying hard enough and so forth. Then what would the solutions be? Well, okay, you remediate the deficit, you celebrate cultural diversity, and you try to be as colorblind as possible. And that's kind of a dominant way of looking at the world. From the perspective of people marginalized on the basis of race, these are actually very different. How do you understand the nature of society? Well, it's been historically rigged by white people for the benefit of white people. How do you understand the nature of your own community that may be not doing as well as you wish it would? In terms of strengths, in terms of resources, the community is a source of strength. There's a long history of struggle that can be drawn on. How do you understand the nature of solution? Remove barriers for those that experience them identify. So two very different perspectives. And sort of learning to hear each other's perspective, and particularly for those of us who are white, to hear perspectives and counter stories of people of color is, I think, super important here. One more idea is the intersection between racism and other forms of oppression. So the idea here is that for like African-American women, is experiences aren't the same as African-American men or the same as white women. Race and gender kind of intersect. Or Latinos, language becomes an issue, language intersecting with, with race. So looking at those intersections in, in our identities. And then the last, a commitment to work for social justice, that even if racism exists and it's not gonna go away during my lifetime, I'm still about the work of trying to make things fairer for myself and people in my community. Just a couple more things about what critical race theory is. There are different branches of critical race theory. As you might have noticed from looking at the people who founded it, they were mostly African American. And as critical race theory has been taken up by other groups, it's developed adaptations to deal with concerns of those groups. So there's Latin crit theory, which looks at Latinos and really deals with the issue of language in ways that critical race theory that's defined by African Americans doesn't so much. Tribal crit, as it's been taken up by indigenous people. There's critical race feminism, Asian crit, critical whiteness studies, and discrit, which is an intersection between disability and critical race theory. And I just put up here some things that make any of these branches critical, what they all have in common. And basically what they have in common is they center an analysis of systemic racism. And they also center the voices of people who are members of that group and analyze those within a context of looking at power relations. And they all use an intersectional analysis of some where they look at race in relationship to something else. Just one example of a study that's using critical race theory. This is one that got published about a year ago looking at lab crit theory. And I decided to put it on the screen here because the theoretical framework that they have, you can see where critical race theory is kind of the overarching umbrella and then lab crit theory under that. And then they used racist nativism as a way of looking at the experiences of undocumented Chicano students in higher education. So let me go on to the next question here. How did critical race theory become the big issue that it is right now? In July of 2020, I remember hearing that Trump had banned critical race theory. And my reaction was to laugh because, well, because I was sort of used to hearing him say sort of silly things. And I knew that he hadn't studied critical race theory. I had a pretty good idea that he hadn't. And besides that, how do you ban a theory? 
<laughs> okay, so you're reacting about the way I reacted, so I'm not going to take this seriously. Um, but there, there's a, a backstory here as to what was going on that a lot of us who work with race and education or race and, and wh wherever our, our field is, I kind of think we're paying attention to and, until all of a sudden this thing exploded. So I want to go back to the election of Barack Obama, which totally blew a lot of people out of the water. A lot of white people who were just a black family is not supposed to be in the White House at all, as well as the very wealthy elite, um, the Koch brothers and others, who had poured lots of money into trying to defeat Obama and assumed that the money would take care of it and didn't really see the power of this multiracial coalition that had enough votes to get Obama over the finish line. Jane Mayer, in her book Dark Money, wrote, during the previous eight years of Republican rule, this conservative corporate elite had consolidated its power, amassing enormous sway over the US government's regulatory and tax laws. Some in this group faulted <coughs> President Bush for not having been conservative enough. But having molded policy to serve their interests during the Bush years, many members of this caste had accumulated phenomenal wealth and regarded the newly elected Democratic president as a direct threat to all they had gained. Participants feared they were seeing not just the passing of eight years of Republican dominance, but the end of a political order, one that they believed had immeasurably benefited both the country and themselves. And I think the idea that it wasn't just you know, four years that they were worried about, but it was about this shift in which they would no longer be in control. And the shift, a lot of it had to do with the changing demographics. This slide is from NBC Nightly News, shows the projections up until 2060, by which time the US itself will probably be about 43% white. And there will be no racial ethnic majority. It's actually, I think, somewhere in the 2040s that will be the tipping point. Um, in California, we live in a state in which there is no racial ethnic majority. And I mentioned the public schools, there is no racial ethnic majority. And so this changing demographics for a lot of white people simply feels threatening. There were some researchers that did a study a couple of times, and this slide is drawn from one of their studies, where they asked white people the extent to which they agreed with the idea of an America where most people are not white bothers me. You know, agree, disagree. The control group were people who were just simply asked that question, respond to that question. And you can see there's quite a few you know, people who were bothered. But when the treatment group was showing them the data and then asking them the question, the number who were bothered just shot way up. In addition, I mentioned that we live in a, a quite segregated society, and it's really white people that are the most segregated. Our friendship groups tend to be way predominantly white. On the average, the average white person has 91 of their friends are white, and only nine of their friends are people of color. African Americans, also predominantly African American friends, but more that are non-African American. And what that means is that we're surrounded every day by people who are, look like us and think like us, and so we're not really getting perspectives from other communities very well at all. We, we may be getting other white people's perspectives about race, but not necessarily perspectives of people of color. So for white people, the idea of being then in the minority where we're surrounded by people of color, for a lot of people it's, it's scary. For some people it's not, but for a lot of people it is. Now, come up to 2020 and the murder of George Floyd and the summer of racial reckoning and all of the protests. You look at this slide, which is one of the protests from New York City, and this represents protests that were going on all over the country. And you probably remember seeing people out in the streets. Well, this is the energized social justice electorate that had elected Barack Obama. Uh, energized and ready to do something. And there are white people in this. This is a multiracial group. The people in the front are African American, but when you look at it, there are white people in there, it's, it's a multiracial group. And so the question for those on the right who are concerned about, we don't want another Obama elected, and we want to be able to kind of keep things as they are, what are we going to do? Because um, if, if these folks go to the polls en masse, the way they're turning out in the streets, uh, how do we control that? So the question then became, how do we at least peel off as many white people as possible, so they'll vote more conservative and peel off 
some of the conservative leading people of color so to try to get the numbers up so that somebody not like Obama can get elected. So enter Chris Rufo. Well, here he is on Tucker Carlson. But Chris Rufo is a blogger for the Manhattan Institute, which is a conservative think tank. He lives outside of Seattle. He believes that the 1960s leftist radicals have taken over the country. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I was thinking, wow, where? I was <laughs> and, and he believes that they've done that by instituting offices of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, that any institution or business that has somebody in charge of DEI, that's the point from which the institution now no longer does what it used to do, and is now all about diversity. I kid you not. So he had gotten hold of some diversity training materials that were being used in Seattle for Seattle public employees. And I'll just say a little bit about diversity training in the workplace. Some of it's good and makes a difference. Some of it isn't good and doesn't make a difference. If it's more job related and it helps you see what you can do differently in the job, it's more likely to do some good. And if it's not job related, it may not have any impact. But he was horrified by what he saw. He saw it as being racist, as promoting segregation, as being anti-American. So he wrote a blog post, posted it on the Manhattan Institute website, and asked if anybody else reading this blog, if you've seen diversity trainings, um, send me whatever you've seen. So some people from around the country sent him stuff. And then he wrote a bigger blog post about not only what's wrong with workplace diversity training, but the fact that some of it is supported by federal funds. And he was like, this should not be happening. So Tucker Carlson found out about him and what he was doing, invited him to be on Tucker Carlson. I didn't see this, but I've seen segments of it. So he was on Tucker Carlson, and he called on President Trump to shut down the use of federal funds in this training. And he started using the term critical race theory. And in a minute, I'll get to why he was using this term. But Trump, who gets his news by watching Fox, saw Tucker Carlson interviewing Chris Rufo, contacted Chris Rufo, and said, I like you, come to the White House. So Rufo did. And two days later, Trump issued his directive banning the use of federal funds for diversity training in anything connected with the federal government. And it's come to the president's attention that the executive branch agencies have spent millions of taxpayer dollars to date training government workers to believe in divisive anti-American propaganda. And the words divisive anti-American propaganda show up now in laws that states have passed banning teaching critical race theory. And I'll get to those in a few minutes. So at about the same time, the 1619 Project was getting a lot of attention. And that's why I see a bunch of heads there. The 1619 Project, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, was a project of the New York Times headed by Nicole Hannah-Jones. She's African American. And she wanted to look at US history from the vantage point of the first Africans to set foot on North American soil and then the Africans that came after and their descendants. Because she'd gone through schools where the history she learned was from the vantage point of the white people who came with African Americans added in. But she wanted a history that really spoke to her. So she worked with the New York Times. Um, essays were written and then put together into a book and the book was getting publicity. In July of 2020, Tom Cotton, senator from Arkansas, introduced a law, the Saving American History Act, that would ban the use of federal funds for disseminating or teaching or using the 1619 Project at all. That act didn't go anywhere, but it kind of spurred Trump to creating the 1776 Project that you might have heard about, which was his attempt to rewrite the curriculum around patriotic themes there was a group that was assembled and started working, and I'm not sure that they're, I mean, it's sort of like. But two weeks after he met with Chris Rufo, he gave this speech in front of the National Archives Museum. In somber, almost sedated tones, Trump signaled to his white base that he doesn't think structural racism is to blame for any social inequities. Now, he hasn't studied this stuff. In short, 
Not only is the Summers National Reckoning over Police Violence and Racism unnecessary in his book, it's also un-American. Uh, students in our universities are inundated with critical race theory. This is the Marxist doctrine holding that America is a wicked and racist nation, and that even young children are complicit in oppression, and our entire society must be radically transformed, Trump said. Critical race theory is being forced into our children's schools, it's being imposed into the workplace trainings, and it's being deployed to rip apart friends, neighbors, and families. Now, if you want to get people up in arms, tell them something is being done to their kids in school that is nefarious, and people will show up. So back to Christopher Rufo and why he picked up on critical race theory. He looked at the trainings, looked at things that people who did the trainings were reading, looked at the footnotes, and identified the term critical race theory, and glommed onto that term because he'd been looking for a way of galvanizing white voters to show up at the polls and vote conservative. And he was like, wow, I got the tool right here. Um, and he's written about this. He's, I don't even have to try to imagine what he was thinking. He's written about it in an interview in The New Yorker. He's explained his strategy. So he says, its connotations are all negative to most middle-class Americans, including racial minorities, who see the world as creative rather than critical, individual rather than racial, practical rather than theoretical. Strung together, the phrase critical race theory connotes hostile, academic, divisive, race-obsessed, poisonous, elitist, and anti-Americans. Then this is what got sold to the American public. In his tweets, he lays some of it out too. And this tweet, We've successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn to toxic, which they did, as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. And then in this tweet above that, he explains, CRT is the ideology. DEI, or diversity, equity, and inclusion, is how it gains power by having you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion offices and somebody in charge of that. Once you have a DEI person in you, then, then it starts taking over. Social emotional learning, SEL, is how it reaches your kids. And I was blown away when I first heard about the attacks on social emotional learning. Because from an educator's perspective, what social emotional learning is, is teachers helping kids learn to identify and manage their own emotions. So you know, if they have outbursts of anger, why, and then how do you uh, so know that that's coming, what do you do about it? If you're afraid of mass, where does that fear come from? How can you replace it with emotions that will help you get through mass? And so social emotional learning is part of this, they're calling that part of critical race theory. And, but from Rufo's perspective, so, uh, when teachers start messing with kids' emotions, they're softening them up to worse an ideology down their throat. They're, they're softening them up so that they'll want to change their gender. And, you, know, you, just like, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so various things then got thrown into this toxic bucket that Chris Rufo created. So here with this quote, when parents hear terms like equity, anti-racism, cultural competence, culturally responsive education, restorative justice, ethnic study, equitable math, whiteness, and all of those things, then got equated with critical race theory. And Fox News has amplified this enormously. There's a, a blip down there in September 2020, which was when Rufo was on Tucker Carlson, and then kind of not too many mentions for a few months, and then all of a sudden this exponential rise of mentions. And other news media started picking up on it because it was so pervasive on Fox that it spread through other news media. And so, uh, you know, the American public was getting kind of blasted with this critical race theory. It, it, it sounds absolutely horrible. And the way Rufo manufactured it, it does sound absolutely horrible. And it's like something horrible is happening to your kids, and you need to get them to stop it. <laughs> so a number of states have enacted legislation then restricting how race and gender can be talked about in the classroom. This is a map put together by the African American Policy Forum that Kimberly Crenshaw is, is heading up. As of this last March, these are the states that had, in one form or another, enacted legislation or other policies limiting how race and gender could be talked about in the classroom. 
And these were states in which at least there was state legislation that had been filed. Another group that keeps track of this stuff shows here 36 states that have <coughs> legislation to restrict education on racism, bias, and the contribution of specific racial or ethnic groups. But on the contrary, 17 states that have expanded how you can talk about race, gender in the classroom, with California being one of those with a requirement coming up that schools have a course in ethnic studies. And there are a few states on here that have both of those going on, and I don't know exactly how that's playing out. Just to look at a little bit of the legislation, um, Florida law precludes materials that make any individual feel discomfort, <laughs> guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of his, her race, color, sex, or national origin. And this is particularly targeting white kids' discomfort if they're learning about racism. And that the concern here isn't about black kids' discomfort about being in a classroom where people deny that racism exists but rather white kids' discomfort. And that runs through a lot of the pushback against the so-called critical race theory. Or North Dakota precludes instruction that indicates that racism is not merely the product of learned individual bias or prejudice, but that racism is systematically embedded in American society and the American legal system to facilitate racial inequality. So the earlier examples I showed of the household wealth gap or the infant mortality gap if you live in North Dakota in an education institution, you cannot analyze those questions using a structural racism, institutional racism perspective. Mm -hmm. You can only analyze it using an individual prejudice perspective. Outside of the schools, you can do that, but not inside of the schools. And so then we have a lot of censorship happening. Pan America is one of the organizations that keeps track of banned books, and this last fall, they had found 1,477 instances of individual books banned affecting 874 unique book titles. The bans occurred in 37 states with Texas, Florida, Missouri, Utah, and South Carolina leading the pack, which I call state-sanctioned ignorance because that is essentially what it is. Here's a map of the U.S. just showing the states and the numbers of books that have been banned. And then the books that have been most banned, and most of them are books that deal with LGBTQ issues, but also a significant number of books by African American authors about African American experiences have been banned. And, and even by banning discussion of racism in the classroom, if you have African American kids who want to be able to talk about their experiences, it's, it's kind of like, hmm, can't do that. The College Board has an African American history class, AP class, and you've probably heard about the flap in Florida, about Ron DeSantis saying you can't teach that here unless you X out everything having to do with critical race theory. So this slide just shows some stuff that got Xed out. And if you look at in the top bullet, the intersection of race, gender, class, okay, intersectionality in Florida, we don't do that, so X that out. Other pieces in here that have to do with analyzing relationships between racism in the past and racism in the present, we don't do that. There's, there is no systemic racism in the present. You could look at it in the past, but not in the present, so that gets X'd out. I have a friend who lives in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's also having a similar, similar to-do about the African American AP history class. And his son goes to Central High School, which was the high school where desegregation was initially launched. And the son signed up for uh, African American history, the AP class. And their governor, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, okay, so she, she wants to be like Ron DeSantis. So she's, we don't do critical race theory in our schools. So that course goes out. And this is right before school was starting, and the kids had signed up for it, and, the, and the, all of a sudden the governor is saying, we're not gonna, we can't run that class. So the Little Rock School Board, bless them, unanimously passed a resolution that we will offer this course. And then Sarah Huckabee Sanders said, well, you can't use it for graduation. So I don't know where that's from. <laughs> a week ago, I went to a webinar featuring teachers who had lost their jobs 
because of critical race theory. Not because of the theory, but because of all this brouhaha that's been created. The Washington Post has estimated, it has names of 160 teachers who have either lost their jobs, have been fired, or have resigned because of stuff related to critical race theory. But there are more who just aren't on the Washington Post list. But these four teachers, uh, one of them's from Florida, one's from Wisconsin, one's from Tennessee, and one is from Texas. And what they all have in common is that they have been teaching for quite a number of years. And they were doing things that they had ordinarily been doing as teachers. Uh, and it was like the line changed, they crossed the line. Not because they all of a sudden moved over to do something else, but because where the line is. It, it sort of crossed where they were. Mm -hmm. This teacher from Florida teaches at a school called Robert E. Lee High School, and it's predominantly African-American students. And so she's been pushing to get the name of the school changed. Well, the white alumni from Robert E. Lee didn't like that, and so they took her to the school board, and she eventually lost her job. <coughs> this teacher here stands up for LGBTQ students. And she didn't know she was doing anything until she got suspended. And then she was told it's because of critical race theory. And she's like, what's that? And, and so <laughs> and she, she said she had to go and Google it to find out what people were saying that she was doing. She, she, and then she eventually lost, lost her job. And what I learned from listening to her was something of the inanities that are happening right now. In Waukesha, Wisconsin, rainbows are banned. Um, what? Oh, what? <laughs> I kid you not. No, my little pony. Yeah, because of the association with LGBTQ. It's apparently a rainbow song that's supportive of the diverse. So you're not supposed to sing that, so rainbows have been banned. And I think of my granddaughter who lives about two school districts away who loves rainbows. So the effect of all of this, there are two effects. One effect has been to silence the voices of people of color, particularly African Americans, as well as LGBTQ people, or anybody who's talking about gender. It just silence voices and make people feel afraid to speak up because they don't know if they're gonna lose their job, they don't know if they might end up in jail. And a second effect has been to try to empower a group of mostly suburban white folks, and that's kind of a broad swath, but that's largely who it is who will then show up at the ballot box to elect a different school board if they feel like the schools are doing something bad for their kids, but then will vote a ballot. You know, it won't just vote for the school board, but they'll vote for everything else. But these protests that you've probably seen on the news in school board meetings and city council meetings, it's not just local folks rising up. It's a well-orchestrated campaign where busloads of people go around and show up and pretend like they're local folks, but they're not actually, but that will be to push back against the school board or to push back against city council policies. And I know that for a fact because in the book, a couple of uh, friends of mine who I've interviewed, one of them from Southern California, the other one from Denver, uh, both experienced school board meetings where these busloads would arrive of strangers from someplace else to kind of take over the meeting and then do all this rabble rousing. So then on the news, it looks like the local folks hate what's going on in the schools, but actually it's, that's not necessarily the case. Okay, is critical race theory taught in schools and would it be bad for kids if it were? It is possible to find instances of what a teacher will identify as critical race theory somewhere in a school. But you could probably, like 99.9% .9 of the classrooms, you could go in and critical race theory isn't being taught. But I need to kind of contextualize the question, looking at the curriculum that is taught. This slide shows several things. One of them is student demographics, who's in the public schools now in the US. And teacher demographics. So there's a real mismatch you can see here between the kids and the teachers. And then social studies and reading language arts texts. Those were analyses that I and some graduate students did of a bunch of textbooks that are being used at a nationwide level. And we did it by going through and counting the pictures of people and the names of people who were mentioned to be studied to get kind of an idea of whose knowledge was in the textbook. Let's look at Latinos. 28% of the student population, a Latino kid may get a Latino teacher or not. Social studies texts, make it to social studies texts in which they don't see themselves at all. 
but, or at the high end, 4% of the people in the text are Latino. Because that's not very many. And reading language arts, they're more likely to see themselves, but it's still always in a minority. So that this kind of says that you know schools are really for somebody else. The most work in textbooks has been done to try to diversify textbooks with African Americans for about the last three decades. So the social studies texts, between two and 28% of the people in social studies texts were African American, quite a bit of variation. And in the reading language arts texts, between nine and 33% of the people. But the people who are most likely to see themselves are kids who are white, who are most likely to have teachers who look like <coughs> themselves and see themselves, people like themselves, at least racially, not necessarily gender, not necessarily class, but racially in the majority through the textbooks. If you're getting kind of the regular bread and butter of what kids are getting in the classroom, it's, it's not neutral. It's just, it's not racially neutral. Tara Yasso from UC Riverside has written an article where she asked, what would a critical race curriculum look like? And I found this really interesting because she took the tenets of critical race theory and then thought in terms of, so how would this apply to curriculum? Not so much teaching kids about critical race theory, but using the principles to put your curriculum together. Well, students are not blamed for perpetuating educational inequality. Blame is placed on white dominated institutions. Oh, well, that makes sense. Knowledge of and by people of color is central rather than marginal part of the public school curriculum. Okay. Curriculum begins with and is structured around the experiences of communities of color. Racism is a focus. Curriculum explores and utilizes shared and individual experiences of race, racism, class, gender, immigration, status, language, and sexuality. Collaboration with organizations that nurture and reclaim community history and historical memory. Well, that sounds like a really good idea. Con Locke wrote an article about what would a critical race pedagogy look like. Well, the foundation involves building trusting relationships among teachers and students. Good idea. You need to do that. <laughs> Practices that incorporate student voice and experience democratize the classroom. I like it. Intentionality in the critical texts and activities students engage in will shape their analysis of social issues. And neutrality represents a falsehood in education that should be explicitly debunked, including the idea that the teacher is not neutral. Now you put these together and you actually have a pretty good description of ethnic studies. But if this represents a good description of ethnic studies, then what's the impact of ethnic studies on kids? Well, it so happens that I've reviewed that literature. <laughs> I was asked by the National Education Association, the main teachers union, in 2011 to review the literature of the impact of ethnic studies on students. And then I and a colleague updated that review not too long ago. And this slide shows ethnic studies curriculum and student achievement. A bunch of different studies at different points in time. What kind of an impact did they have on student achievement? Just a little bit about the slide here, the different kinds of ethnic studies curriculum. These are all K through 12. Different kind of research designs, mostly qualitative, but some quantitative. The outcomes, GPA, attendance, credit towards graduation, college attendance, standardized test scores, test scores, math achievement tests, blah, blah, blah. Impact, positive, 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 and then one that found no impact. Hmm. The impact of ethnic studies curriculum and asset-based pedagogies, which mainly refers to building on what your students bring to the classroom and regarding that as assets, so their language, their culture, you, you become familiar with that and then weave that into the way you go about teaching. But again, not as many studies, but all positive, 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 positive. The relationship between an ethnic studies curriculum and student identity and sense of self. Positive, except for one that found negative, and this is kind of an anomaly because this study here with a negative was a replication of this study here that found positive. <laughs> so I'm not sure what to make of that, but all the rest of the positive. But the upshot is that if you have an ethnic studies curriculum, for the students of color who are now the majority, it is a good thing in terms of even things like math achievement. What about the impact on white kids? There's less research there, but basically shows a higher ed level Ethnic studies and women's studies usually has a positive impact on students' <coughs> attitudes about race. Students develop greater empathy for the group the curriculum focuses on. 
cross-group interaction can strengthen the positive impact. The impact is greater on white students than on students of color, although white students often struggle initially. This is mostly because for white students, a lot of this information is new. For students of color, it isn't, because they've been living it. And for white students, there often is this emotional struggle of, of feeling guilty, and blah, blah, blah. but if you stick with it, then students start learning what they can do, which I'll get to in a minute. And then instruction taking students' actual questions into account is more powerful than instruction that doesn't. So here's an example of a fifth grade anti-racist lesson in a predominantly white school, just so you can see what this could look like. What the teacher wanted to teach was to have the students understand the difference between racist behavior and anti-racist behavior. And to understand racist behavior, it can be active so that you see it, it can also be inactive in terms of what the person is thinking about. Anti-racist behavior, it can be active, and you can be actively anti-racist, but you can't be passively anti-racist. If you're passive, you're doing nothing. And so even if you're thinking, oh my God, this, this example of racism, this should not be happening. If you're not doing anything, you're not changing anything. But you could be passively racist by, yeah, okay, I, I, I agree, that's, that's, you don't articulate it, but you agree with it. And you, in, in either case, being well, passive allows something to continue. So to teach that, to help students learn, just learn that idea, play with that idea, she drew from a book by Judy Bloom called Iggy's House. It tells the story of Winnie, who's a white girl, and her best friend is Iggy, who lives in the house across the street. Well, one day the moving van pulls up, and Iggy and her family are moving. And so, my Iggy, <laughs> um, then an African-American family moves in. And this is a predominantly white community. And the neighbors aren't real happy, most of them, about having an African-American family there. Winnie goes across the street, makes friends with the family, gets to know the kids. But she's like, why aren't the other people around me doing the same thing? And so she finds out that her parents don't really like having a black family across the street. Um, some of the other neighbors don't really like having a black family across the street. And so she has to figure out what to do about that. What the teacher did was, after the students read the book, using whole group discussion, they went through character by character and talked about, um, would you call this person racist behavior or anti-racist behavior? Was it active? Was it passive? And they had real good discussions about the, the characters in relationship to this framework. And when they finished doing that, the kids were going, well, okay, Winnie did engage in anti-racist behavior. She tried to convince her, her parents, for instance, to get to know this family. But she could have done more. Well, what could she have done that was more? And then the students started brainstorming some things that they thought Winnie could have done. So then the teacher said, okay, how would you like to rewrite the end of the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then the kids rewrote the end of the book. And what this did is it gave the kids something that they could do to address the problem. And when you're working with kids, um, anybody around racism, but especially white people, white kids who feel like, like I've inherited it's a, a system that, like, okay, I didn't create that system. No, you didn't. And you have choices as to what you want to do in, in, sort of as you go through life. And we can help you see some choices that would actually address the problem rather than perpetuate the problem. And so with the story of, of working with the Judy Bloom book, the kids were able to engage in something anti-racist of where they could talk openly about what anti-racist behavior would look like and then rewrite the end of the book. So just the last slide here, that uh, this was put together by the Aspen Institute and it kind of pulls a lot of this stuff together. Research shows that teaching students about racism has overwhelmingly positive effects for all races, all students. 86% of the children think that people in the U.S. are treated unfairly on the basis of race. Um, we oftentimes think that children don't see this stuff and think about this stuff, but they do. Nearly half of the children surveyed reported that racism was at the top of their mind. And so if we're pretending like racism doesn't exist, and the kids are wondering about it, we're not really doing them a favor. Courses that teach the history of race in America improve student outcomes. And teachers need support to improve their practice, but avoiding teaching about race and racism is detrimental to students' learning and healthy development. 
Well, I thank you so much for being here on this beautiful Monday morning.